Welcome back to this session. I think this is an important session after the uh, preliminary framing the topic on extremism, racism, uh, are mutually reinforcing uh, session, and also the launch of the report and the app, the press conference, and things of that sort. We now come to the session entitled ASEAN Neighbors, Innovative Responses to Extremism. I think it's important to recognize that seeds of extremism are sown when there is intolerance to others or when diversity is not respected or when justice is denied uh, in society. And so we see the seeds then building up either from racism or from religious extremism of some kind. Uh, and so I think it's important that this panel uh, not just focuses on Malaysia, but also looks at the regional realm and possibly how the international discussion and international action or inaction on this theme uh, impacts Malaysia. And possibly the speakers in the 15 minutes that is given to them, because we might extend slightly beyond one o'clock, uh, because we have had a late morning tea, uh, then can look at a number of areas looking at their own context. We have four countries being discussed today, so it's not just Malaysia-centric. It has a strong ASEAN flavor to it. So it's Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Myanmar. So we look at the national scene and also look at our neighbors in the context of uh, root causes, uh, innovations, um, to note what are enabling environment or the presence of ideology of some kind or action, or policies, or framework that will enable uh, a shift or in addressing uh, the root issues and addressing uh, it in a significant way uh, and then moving beyond. So we have uh, four uh, panelists. Uh, they are only given 15 minutes, but uh, we'll see um, with the question answer. I think it's important to have uh, both activists, um, uh, sort of social activists, or uh, people from religious background. Uh, and it's also very important to have people of the uniform, uh, although he's not wearing uh, his uniform today. Uh, but I think it's important to hear from Superintendent Ahmad uh, Azmadi bin Haji Muhammad Salim. Uh, he is with the Extremist Social Division. Hopefully the division is not extremist, but it's addressing uh, issues of extremism. Uh, I think the Royal Malaysian Police at Bukit Aman has been handling this issue, and historically we have confronted the uh, communist uh, issues in the past uh, successfully, uh, but now to address religious um, as well as uh, other forms of extremism. So let's start with Superintendent Ahmad and let's give a hand to uh, Tuan Ahmad to take the step. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam satu Malaysia. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis Sanjay Surya is our moderator, my fellow speakers, uh, Ms. Anissa Wahid, Ms. Ismail Ibrahim, and also Mr. Nikki Daim. All distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here this morning on the occasion of the CIS National Conference on Non-Discrimination organized by Pusat Thomas. Let me congratulate the organizer, even though with a very short notice to me, uh, for giving me an opportunity to participate and deliver some point of views regarding ASEAN neighbors, you know, at these responses to extremism. 
in our perspective of view, especially in terms of security side. So my name is Superintendent Ahmad Asmadi bin Haji Muhammad Salim from Royal Malaysia Police. So the Royal Malaysia Police is the main institution charged with the responsibilities of ensuring the maintenance of law and order in Malaysia. So in this respect, the RMP places great importance on the effectiveness of law enforcement within the context of the Malaysian criminal justice system. Apart from the traditional role of maintenance of law and order, the RMP also play a fundamental role in the promotion of the national security in terms of economic, social and political development to Malaysia. So if you see the goal or objective of national security is to protect its core values. For example, its citizen, the government of the day, territory, sovereignty and the ideology. Thus, in a nutshell, the national security of a country is preserved and enhanced if its core values are free from any risk emanating from internal and external threat. So besides the above core values, other contributing factors which are equally important and relevant to secure national security include national unity through a united society, stable political system and sound economic achievement. Even though we understand what the core function of the RMP remain unchanged, policing in the new millennium has changed significantly. Traditional crimes have evolved and mutated into something more complex, sophisticated and transborder in nature. So the rapid advancement, advancement in information communication technologies has facilitated the mutation of new breeds of crime. In this, globalization has a compounding impact on crime today. So I would like to touch about racial challenges in Malaysia. Even though it's been discussed earlier, but I think in our perspective, racial extremists within the Malaysian multi-ethnic society found nourishment to further their ends in an added atmosphere of external and internal factors. So if you see, we are uh, actually receiving from the colonial, for the past of the colonial. So there's a lot of issues that we need to face and we need to rebuild again to make our country more safe. So the underlying factor in this instance of, is the feeling of resentment between the Malays and the minority ethnic such as Chinese and Indian communities. Each anxious not only to protect what it already has, but to fight for a bigger portion, in particular the nation's economic kick and political power. So where does the struggle came from? Given such a setting in the makeup of the Malaysian society, what naturally followed was a struggle to fight for interests through respective political parties, which are largely race-based. I'm not going to in, uh, encroach to the political parties or any other NGOs or whatsoever, but from that issue, the survival of each party depends on its ability to champion the causes of the race it represents. Thus, this pattern of politicking has invariably created a certain extent of uneasiness, particularly between the ethnic groups in the country. Hence, the concept of one Malaysia exposed by the present premiership aspires to strengthen ethnic harmony, national unit, unity and efficient governance. Without unity and loyalty to the nation, in a diverse nation like ours, all our effort to achieve a better life for our citizens will be futile. So apart from above racial differences, there are still potential threat to Malaysia political stability and social harmony. However, in a recent study has shown that there is a decrease of racial incidence report to us, to us throughout the country. I don't know, with the new apps that have been implemented recently, maybe it will become more. <laughs> but I don't know if they pass it to us. <laughs> so, so the statistic shows that there were 323 incidents with racial overtones in 2016 until this October, compared to 516 in 2015 and 820 in 2014. Most of these incidents involved Malays and Indians. Most of it, not all, but most of it, arising out of petty dissatisfaction 
road accident as well as workplace misunderstanding and some other grievances. And another matter that we found out after the past two general election when the government cannot return the two-third majority. So we find out to a certain extent change the political scenario. For the political survival, certain political parties have reported to exploiting sensitive uh, religious and racial issues in their bid to solicit more support. These politicians have time and again made uncalled for remarks. So I'm not blaming them, but this is a part of the system that we have at the moment. So both seditious and sensitive in nature putting to test racial integration and tolerance among the people. With regard to this, the Royal Malaysia Police has identified 64 flash points throughout the country where racial incidents are rampant due to density, demography and social status of their population. Racial incidents in these areas normally happen out of spontaneous, but if not been controlled, it will be out of uh, control for, by, by us. So, because if you find out the purpose of preserving racial harmony and national security, Royal Malaysia Police will continue to intensify vigilance and focus attention, especially in these areas, to prevent any outbreak and serious racial conflict. But we cannot work alone. We need to work closely with the cooperation of ass and assistance from various other agencies or government department and also the NGOs. We are, need are needed to manage this problem. I would touch a bit about religious challenges because it goes similarly and concurrently with the uh, racial issues because it's a part of our life here. Malaysia is no exception from any other multi-religious countries caught in the truth of religious extremism. So if we find out in our own country, we are facing a lot of group that using religious as a part or a tool for them to gain their support and to gain their own objective. But the way they approach it, the organization ranges from the moderate to the radical, from pro-government to anti-government with differing ideologies, strategies and activities entrenched in our multiracial society. Given such a setting, it is natural that the activities of the Islamic religious extremists have had profound effect on our national security. So because of the constraint of the time, I won't, I won't discuss much about the religious challenges that we face, but just to name it, a few groups that we managed to encounter before, like the Shia movement, but it's still in the growing, al arkam Darul Islam, JIO, uh, lots of other groups that we are facing. So the security challenge we have to contend with religious extremism is that although we have contained the activities of the religious extremist movement, we nevertheless are unable to fully neutralize that threat. Domestically, we need to contain the politics of extremism by a certain political party in misusing misinterpreting and manipulating Islam to its political advantage that could put the stability of our nation at stake. And maybe also we would touch a bit about when there's an issue before this, for instance in December 2007, when Herod the Catholic Weekly, which was published by the Malaysia Catholic Church, was found to contain the word Allah in its publication. So it's become an issue become an uh, grievances for certain certain group and certain other movement. So from there on, if we find out from between 31st December 2009 and 27 January 2010, a total of 166 activities of objection were reported in the form of demonstration, sending of memorandum, press conference, meeting, including 19 incidents of arson and mischief on 11 churches one church run school and seven surah. So this is not good for our own country and for our own stability. Tension among the followers of the different religions escalated, but there were some sensible people from the respective religions who became vigilant to safeguard the various places of worship that may become targets of further arson or mischief. Nevertheless, from police action in arresting the culprit and charging them in court has helped to calm the situation. But it doesn't stop there. 
it's still ongoing issues that we need to tackle and we need to handle. A part of terrorism, I think, I also not not uh, nothing much that I can touch here because uh, the issue actually is related, radical to extremism, and they become a terrorism. But through over the year, from our record, there's a 60 group that we identified. 26 is local militant group, 28 regional militant group, and 9 international group. They are not work uh, just from in, inside, but they also engage with international, part with the Philippines, from the Indonesia side, from other Asian countries. But I won't encroach to the territory because it's not mine. So, uh, a few measures taken by the government or by our outside to make sure this thing can be contained even though we cannot curb it at all. So we find out, for example, we, to counter this threat, the Prime Minister of Malaysia had on 29 September 2015 during a conference in countering ISIL and violent extremism held in New York where we already formed counter messaging center so Malaysia was given the mandate by the United States to establish this counter messaging center in Kuala Lumpur similar to what which was set up between the United States and the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi known as Asawab or the Right Path Center this counter mess messaging center is Malaysia initiative to monitor and counter both the terrorists and extremists views in Southeast Asia in its bid to curb the influence of IS in the cyber world and other issues. Based in Kuala Lumpur, the center will be used by Asian countries along with Australia and New Zealand as a point of reference and synchronizes effort to counter terrorism effectively. The CMC headed by the Director of Special Brand comes into effect in, uh, on the 1st April 2016. It's still new. And recently, if you heard about the National Special Operation Force, where it was formed on 27 October 2016 and was launched by our Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak to combat terror, threat, terror threats in Malaysia. The task force, which consists of existing personnel from the elite unit from the police, army, navy, and maritime agencies, so that we work together. Because before this, we experienced when we are facing Lahat Datu issues, so it's very difficult. Not so difficult, but when you need to put or to combine all effort, all team in one unit, so it will be difficult to give proper instruction. So with this, we are hoping that uh, the situation can be more easy to handle and to, to tackle. And part of it, we also made a few approaches that we approach, uh, we meet, we greet, we also uh, make an engagement with the university, for example, with other government agencies, with the NGOs. So with this engagement, uh, we give some aspect of uh, the security aspect, uh, also about how to handle certain certain issue, where the public can help us in terms to handle certain certain issue. Because when it become a terrorist, it consider very late for us already. Because we not stop it at the earlier stage. We must find out from the earlier stages and we must know what is, what is the cause of the action and what is the route that we need to stop. So part of uh, the system or part of the implement, uh, implemented system that has been done is in the concept of de-radicalization. So yesterday our Deputy Prime Minister talked about it in Singapore if, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that is the overall overview that I can share here. So for us, intelligence sharing and intelligent procurement must be enhanced at all levels, be it local, regional or international, to combat the threat of transnational crime, racism, extremism or whatsoever. As we got to domestic threat, a multi-agency approach has long been adopted as part of the national strategy. Been, it has been successful in tackling internal security with the cooperation of the various government agencies. However, in the present day context, greater effort must be coordinated among agencies and various stakeholders, including NGOs assistant, should be enlisted to address issues 
or complex factor at play. So, lastly, once again, I would like to congratulate the organizer for giving me an opportunity to be here and to all the participants for lending me your ear and time. I wish you all the best and really hope that we can move forward together in combating extremism and racial, racialism for building our own future and for Bangsa Malaysia, not just for Bangsa Johor. Thank you very much. <laughs>
is a compulsory element of Islam. Upholding democracy is one of the principles of Islam, which is shura or assembly. There must no longer be anything to differentiate Indonesians based on religion, mother language, culture, and ideology. If today there are people calling Islam bad names, we will teach them that Islam is peaceful. So this, these are uh, his words, and he kept repeating this, um, this uh, perspective when he was the chairperson of the Nadatul Ulama, the biggest Muslim organization, when he was the president of Indonesia, and when, uh, when he was the uh, leader of the um, democratic and human rights movement in Indonesia. So that's what we're trying to emulate. But let's go to, let's uh, see what is the current landscape of Indonesia. When we talk about terrorism, we talk about, um, you know, bombs and attacks, but that's only a, a small part of the problem, right? So uh, I'm using BTI. BTI is Bineka Tunggal Ika, uni uh, Unity in Diversity. That is the slogan of the Indonesian people. So these are the people who are against the uh, Bineka Tunggal Ika. And then we have at the uh, first side, that's the uh, fighters or the militant uh, workers, especially uh, the activists that um, promoting and trying to strengthen uh, the Bineka Tunggal Ika. But now we have, a, uh, we have seen a shift in the mainstream population. The ideas of exclusiveness and intolerance are introduced in daily lives. And this is, this is uh, for us, this is actually bigger problems than terrorism themselves. Yes, terrorism will lead to atrocities, but this problem leads to uh, discrimination in everyday life and civic rights and constitutional rights. It's everyday problem, and it will create a division among a society. So to understand the dynamics, uh, if we want to tackle this issue, we have to understand the dynamics, of course. So to understand this, dy the, this dynamics, uh, Wahid Foundation, one of the wing in uh, our family, uh, Wahid's family, did a survey on potential social religious intolerance and radicalization in Indonesian Muslim society. Because uh, out of 250 million um, uh, citizens of Indonesia, 205 million citizens are Muslims. So these are uh, the Muslims, uh, the biggest Muslim population in a single country at this time. Uh, and we, of course, although it's not really that radical, it still influences a lot of people in Indonesia. So the survey is done uh, in 34 provinces involving 1,500 respondents, and we uh, we were happy, we are happy that 82% of the people, they believe in Pancasila and in democracy as best for Indonesia. So these are the, 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 the values that still hold us together. And 72% reject radicalization, but we still have 7.75 that support radicalization. This 7.7% uh, of the respondents their characteristic uh, are male, uh, young, they listen to sermons, especially from TV and mosques, and they tend to interpret uh, Islam literally. So they, 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 uh, their beliefs are founded on literal interpretation of Islam, and they tend to uh, disregard democracy. Uh, out of this 1,500 respondents, 62% dislike specific uh, groups, either LGBT, communist Christians, uh, Chinese communities, etc. 
irrelevant factors for tolerance uh, intolerance is education, income, and residence. So it doesn't really matter if you're living in urban areas or uh, village areas, uh, you can be radicalized. Uh, and the last one is the higher belief in democratic values, the lower the potential for intolerance acts. Another survey that has been uh, going on, so this is an in, uh, ongoing process right now. We are doing a mapping of disseminations of violent extremism ideas on the internet. So uh, we look through internet websites, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, to learn how ideas were spread. And what we found is the key narrative is single truth. Like, uh, single truth is like this. There is only one, uh, one uh, kind of Islam, and this is this way. So another way, another interpretation is wrong. Or we are the true believer, and because of that, we are in highest uh, position than the rest of uh, humankind. And as such, we have to have a bigger privilege. And also, the uh, one keep repeated narrative is that Islam is oppressed by the world. Uh, remember what uh, Gustur said before, it was uh, that this feeling of inferiority and victim thinking it's still, it's still uh, very much um, dominant in, in the Muslim world. So uh, the key messages, these key narratives are uh, detailed into different uh, messages, different platforms. Like for example, if you are targeting the, 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 um, the female uh, mother, female, Female population, like uh, early in, in early marriage, it's rather different than uh, memes that is targeting the you, the the youth, the teenagers. Uh, I'll show you this one. This one, this ganteng. What is the the Mala, uh, Malaysian word for ganteng? Handsome, yeah. Handsome shari. Handsome shari is uh, rambut. Uh, the hair, uh, the hair is not uh, kaza, not not um, uh, apa kaza in 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 English. Straight. Oh shape. Oh shape. And uh, friendly. You have to have your beard. Uh, you have. Uh, uh, tidak pacaran. Not dating. Not dating, and also uh, interesting is about the the pants, the uh, what do you call it, the, the the length of the. This is the kind of memes that try to introduce this uh, this uh, key message. There is only one one kind. If you are a Muslim male youth, then you should roll your uh, pants. If not, then you are not shari. So what happened with the old ulamas who are wearing sarung all the time? Oh, they're not shari also. <laughs> uh, and the agitation level uh, at the at the internet it's from soft to hard. Key terms. Uh, you know our um, our crawling on Twitter, Indonesian Twitter, from 20th of September to October 16, we have found 18,000 tweets containing the word infidels, and 12,000 tweets containing the word um, heretics, sesat and kafir. So you can imagine, just in three weeks. Three weeks, eighteen thousand tweets containing those uh, the the words um, infidels and and so these are the, the the things that you will find on on the internet in Indonesian internet. And to explain this, uh, we try to um, to look at 
what's been going on through frameworks, theoretical frameworks. And it's for us, it's uh, it's easy to understand the, the, the challenge by using this moral foundation t uh, theory. I think uh, Pa Gerald or Dato Denison or uh, one of the speakers before have already mentioned about how come, how come if uh, if we believe that uh, Malaysia is one, then how come people are still uh, discriminate? This moral foundation uh, theory uh, said that we all have these modules in ourselves, modules of values. Now, for um, extremist idea, extreme ideas, the key points will be on the sanctity and degradation. So everything that will violate the sanctity of the divinity of God or religion, then it's of higher importance than the other, even fairness to others or loyalty to uh, your national um, society. It's all below the sanctity. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you have to oppress other people so long as you are doing that for the gospel of God. That's uh, how moral foundation theory works. And the other framework that we are using is uh, the early warning system. I think my time is already, oh, four minutes left. The early warning system uh, from Rapopor and Charney, we're trying to understand how uh, uh, the victim, uh, victimization happened. Like, uh, for example, in Indonesia, the Shiite came at the same time with the Sunnis. Uh, introduced in Indonesia and it was identified before. Oh, those are the Shiites. I'm, I still remember from when I was still a kid living in a small a town uh, then the, the, uh, my grandparents used to say, oh, those are the, the Shiite. But that's it. There is no campaign that uh, the Shiite are infidels, the Shiite are against uh, the Sunnis or the Shiite is, is the enemy of Islam. All those kind of things were not we're not there. When, when did it start? This, this early warning system helped us to understand. So uh, we have these seven indicators that uh, will uh, help us determining uh, in, what, in what stage we are in and how to, uh, how to uh, counter that. But let me go straight to the next one. So this is the, the integrated strategic approach we are uh, implementing right now. Uh, we have the, of course, we start with the resilience base, how to help the grassroots level or uh, at the working at people level. And then we also uh, have to work on the respect base. This is the power of the NGOs and the, especially the faith-based organizations. And the third axis is the faith base. Uh, this is about the, uh, not faith-based, rights-based, yep. This is the public policies. And also, uh, most important is the theological framework to counter the uh, extremist ideas. This is not to be left out because this is uh, probably the most um, effective and uh, substantial fundamental, fundamental approach you know, if, if the, the module, the moral module that is being used is sanctity against degradation or blasphemy, then of course we have to come up with uh, mainstreaming the, 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 um, the belief that Islam rahmatan lil alamin or Islam as the blessing of the universe is the key, not Islam rahmatan lil muslimin, not Islam as the blessing only for the Muslims. Because in the Quran, it is said that that is the, uh, the, the, the God's instruction to Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. So what, what kind of innovations that we have? We need to work on the counter narratives, the Indonesian values and moderate Muslim values. Bineka Tunggal Ika Pancasila Democracy, as you can see from the, the, the survey, are the mod modalities of Indonesian people. Uh, and it leads to saying no to majoritarianism. This is a long goal, a long way to go, but uh, we've, we, we started this campaign. 
And then uh, most important also is to re-strengthen the, the moderate Muslim, Muslim values, especially the traditions and the principles. We need to uh, embrace the online strategies because we're lacking in that. Um, we have to come up with innovative formats and uh, platforms like what has been launched this morning. So in Indonesia, we have Nutizen. Nutizen is, a, is an app like the one Commerce had, but uh, this, this, uh, this app is actually for the moderate Muslim. Uh, this is a, some kind of resource center for the moderate Muslims uh, society. So it, it, housed, it houses the, the recordings of sermons, of uh, writings of uh, moderate Muslims. We also need to engage religious leaders and FBOs. And we are, we are actually, Indonesia is probably blessed with two uh, major mass organizations, Muslim mass organization. That is the Nahdlatul Ulama and the, and the Muhammadiyah. Nahdlatul Ulama right now we have 50 million members. And Muhammadiyah, uh, based on the latest survey, is around uh, 12 to 15 million uh, members. So those are huge organization. And these uh, two organizations, they have come up with different narratives. Uh, from Nahdlatul Ulama, uh, we have Islam Nusantara narrative, while from Muhammadiyah, it's uh, Islam Berkemajuan or uh, Progressive Islam. So this is the, one of the campaign of the Islam Nusantara, Nusantara. We want to remind people that we have a long tradition in the history of the Muslims in Indonesia, a long tradition of uh, uh, synergizing the traditions of the uh, indigenous traditions with the values of Islam. This is a Japanese song but it has uh, uh, Islamic teaching inside. And we use Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, dances also for the da'wah. So those are the innovations. So this is the last uh, slide. At the grassroots level, we create safe spaces for minorities, encounters at community level, level immersions, and for the youth, we are targeting, focusing our work on the youth. Uh, we have all kinds of programs set up for leaders from different faith-based organizations. We also have the advocacy, but the last one, the most important one, is the advocacy for law enforcement. Because in Indonesia, the police are still uh, functioning on the value of social harmony. So to preserve social harmony, sometimes uh, they disregard the constitutional right. So we want to make sure that the police, when they enforce law, then they refer to constitutional right, not forcing social harmony at the cost of the constitutional rights, especially of the minorities. This is very important because we have many we have many uh, discussion or seminars that has been threatened by violent groups and then the, the police said that, okay, before there is riot, then you should stop. Our work is to preserve social harmony and you have angry people after you, so you have to stop. Even though uh, that's, that is the freedom of uh, speech. So this, uh, these are the, the, the innovations that uh, I can share with you right now. And uh, I hope we can continue with uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give a hand um, uh, to Eliza Wahid for uh, highlighting to us the counter narrative, uh, also the highlight on Islam Nusuntara, uh, music, young people, the alternative uh, uh, challenge uh, and advocacy on the police force and how they address the issues. So I think there are a lot of things that emerge uh, from this presentation uh, that we can draw on uh, to see. 
I think uh, in the first two case studies that were presented to us, uh, it's a situation in which the Muslim community uh, is the majority population, whether it's Malaysia or Indonesia, uh, you see that and then see the approaches, similarity, differences um, uh, in it, the, the, the strength of the Indonesian model uh, that's come out uh, in this process. The other two examples that we are going to look at uh, is one from the Philippines and the other Myanmar, where the Muslim community uh, is a more minority community in the context of a dominant uh, Filipino Christian community or Burmese Buddhist environment, and then to see whether there is oppression and suppression uh, and impact on fundamental liberties uh, and what are the innovations within this context. Now, I met uh, Ustas uh, yesterday, and just as a side humor, if you look at him and me, I think you would think I'm the Ustas. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's just a side point uh, in case you're just looking at externals of religion uh, and not looking at the spirit. Now, what's very significant to the Ustas uh, uh, Ismail Ibrahim's uh, CV and write-up. He has a master's in public administration. Uh, earlier uh, was slightly different. Uh, but I think um, he served on this national commission uh, for Muslims uh, in the Philippines, a special commission that was set up in 2010 by the Filipino uh, president. Uh, and it's to ensure the participation of Muslim Filipinos uh, in nation building. Uh, and it's a significant attempt. But I heard from him last night that with the change of the president, his appointment also concluded. Uh, but I think here, uh, let's give a hand to him. Uh, and other details of his CV is enclosed for us to hear the experiences of someone from Mindanao, and those of us in Malaysia uh, know um, the various issues affecting the people of Mindanao uh, as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ba'da. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to extend our thanks and gratitude for inviting us for today's very important conference and uh, would like to present to you the uh, response of the, the, of the Philippines on matters related to extremism. Uh, my presentation will be divided into main, the, the, the response will be two. Uh, one will be coming from the, the government and number two would be coming from uh, our side, from the, 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 the non-government organization. Uh, briefly, uh, uh, Islam is very, uh, it's the first religion uh, that had a foot, footing in, in the Philippines. In fact, if you're going to see the history or the background of Islam in the Philippines, uh, Islam is far ahead uh, from the Christianity for more than 200 years. And uh, these sultanates that could also be attributed to the Malay world had assisted uh, foreign colonizers for more than 400 years, the Spaniards, the Americans, and even the Japanese. And uh, after the long fight against the foreign invasion, and when the Philippines got its uh, independence from the American, and after, again, a, a, a confrontational a confrontation between the, the, the people of the South and the government, then the president, Marcos, declared martial law uh, in 1972 placing the Philippines under martial law, suspending the civil rights, imposing military authority, 
and suspending or the Congress was abolished. Now, the effect of the martial law, as we have learned, is the, the birth of different organization. And in the South, in the Philippines, uh, the birth of the Moro Fronts, this is more uh, led by young youngsters, uh, and the founder was uh, Nur Meswari, and Ustaz Salamat Hashim was also member, founding member of the Moro National Liberation Front. And uh, because of some differences, Meswari and Salamat had to, to, to part with one another because of some political and ideological differences. And Salamat Hashim had uh, uh, developed or organized his own more Islamic liberation front, MILF, which the Malaysian government had been doing the facilitation for many years in talking with the, the Philippine government. In this respect, we uh, salute and we give our thanks to the Malaysian government for that purpose, for facilitating the negotiation between the MILF and the government of the Philippines. Now, if you see the, the, the effect of war in Mindanao, uh, there are sources uh, who believe that there are about 100,000 to 150,000 or more the casualties of the war in Mindanao. And some say that 50% are from the, uh, from the fronts, 30% uh, are from the government, and 20% from the civilians. And uh, the total economic loss, uh, if that could only be converted into development uh, assistance to, to, the, to, to the Muslims in the Philippines, is estimated to be 640 billion pesos, or roughly, uh, it's about 13.3 billion US dollars, or more or less, it's about 56 billion Malaysian ringgit. So that's, for us, it's a big and huge amount spent by the government, spent for a war which was not yet finalized and no one was a winner between the government and the sessionists from the south. Now, I will not discuss more on the, the, uh, the, uh, the birth of extremism uh, in the Philippines because one, uh, uh, everybody at least have been reading about extremism and radicalization and terrorism in the Philippines. But uh, secondly, because of the time constraint, but nonetheless, these are the groups that are existing in the Philippines. The Abu Sayyaf, the Bangsamor Islamic Freedom Fighters, the Ansarul Daula Fil Philippine, the Ansarul Khalifa Sarangani, the Khalifa Al Islamia in Mindanao, and the Mauti Group uh, in Lanao del Sur. Uh, these are the uh, groups that are operating in the Philippines uh, that are espousing for an independent Muslim state in Mindanao. Now, I will not, dis uh, I've said, uh, uh, lengthily discuss about them, but I wanted to, to share with you what are the factors that motivated this group. Uh, number one is, as mentioned by Sister Eliza, is the, the narratives of using religion uh, uh, and the unresolved conflict in Mindanao, the failure to pass the Bang Samoro Basic Law, which was facilitated, facilitated by the Malaysian government, the Rido, or the conflict, uh, family feud or clan feud, poverty, discrimination and injustices, and the full governance. Now, speaking of the narratives of using the religion as justification, as well said by Sister Eliza, is that for them, they are the one who possess the truth. And for them, uh, if you uh, do not agree with them, then you are their enemies. And if you are their enemies, either you will be punished or you will be killed. So these are the narratives used by these extremists as far as the Philippines is concerned. Number two is the unresolved war in Mindanao. You know, there are a lot of negotiations. There are a lot of peace process. There are a lot of ceasefires. But unfortunately, peace in Mindanao is still very, very elusive. The question remains, when can we have the everlasting and peaceful solution of the conflict in Mindanao. Number two is the failure to pass the Bang Samoro Basic Law. And uh, we have here, uh, you know what, Tumku was, was facilitator and Allah Rahamu, he passed recently. And we owe a lot of thanks to Tumku and his family. And of course to Prime Minister Najib uh, for his effort 
to solve the problem in Mindanao. But unfortunately, the Bank Somoro Basic Law was not passed by the previous administration. There are many reasons. Why? One is that the Congress, the 16th Congress of the Philippines, failed to pass the law. And uh, there are some questions that, that arise. One is that, why is it that the law, the, the proposed law, was not considered as an urgent bill by the President? Number two, you know, Marcos, Bongbong Marcos, Senator Marcos, was the chair of the committee uh, in, in the Senate. And why is it that he was not replaced with the majority of senators that are pro-Aquino? These are the questions that need to be answered up to now. But unfortunately, the main thing here was that the Bank Samoro Basic Law was not passed in the 16th Congress. We don't know with the new president this time. Rido is a family or clan food, feud. And uh, normally, uh, you can find Rido in Muslim Mindanao. When the government, when, when the system, when there is injustices, when the system or the central government is very weak. And this is the clan from years to years, by family to family, grandparents to grandparents up to now. And they have that kind of pre conflict in Mindanao. Next is poverty. You know, poverty is anywhere. But you know, in the Philippines, the, you, you, the 20 poorest, gov the 11 of the poorest provinces are all in Mindanao. And you know, number one, number two, and number five poorest province is in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. In Sulu, the province of Sulu has about 75.3 poverty incidents, very poor. And followed by, no, Lano del Sur is the 75.3 uh, poverty incidents. In Sulu, it's more than 60%. And the fifth one is in Maguindanao, which is more than 50%. So according to them, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the fundamental reasons of this extremism is, is because of poverty incidents in the region. Now, discrimination in injustices. And no less than the cardinal from Mindanao, Cardinal Quebedo, who said that the main cause or root cause of the problem in Mindanao is because of injustice. So even the non-Muslims were telling us that, yes, there is a problem in Mindanao, but the real cause, the root cause of the problem in Mindanao is because of discrimination and injustices and poor governance and corruption. Anywhere you can find corruption. And one time, the Mindanao, or the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, was, ta was tagged as the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the capital of the Philippines on matters related to corruption and election fraud. You can find, if you want to win election, you go to arm Mindanao, then you will win. That's how they capitalized the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. Now, briefly, let us see what the government is doing or was doing. Marcos, he has his, for, for Marcos, he believed that uh, the Tripoli Agreement of 1976 is the answer. But unfortunately, the problem, set, the, the solution given by Marcos was not proven to be successful. We have also the, the yellow one, the mother of our former president, Mrs. Corazon Aquino. Again, he had the new constitution and provided wherein the provision of the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. Again, proven to be not effective because up to now there is a conflict in Mindanao. Now we have the president, Ramos, who also uh, a good president, but unfortunately uh, there was no absolute success or solution to the conflict in Mindanao. Now, uh, we have the Arroyo, again, last time. Uh, she was released from the jail, and she was slumbusting for many years in jail for maybe uh, some, some, some crimes she has done to the, to, the, to the country. And when Duterte, our president today, uh, won the election after less than a month of, or more, uh, uh, this president, Arroyo, uh, was released from prison. Hospital arrest, I should say. Now, let's see uh, what 
and the cab of the Aquino administration last year. You know, uh, for us, uh, we strongly believe that the concept or the, the issue of, uh, of poverty, the issue of injustices, the issue of discrimination could be answered by the FAB or the framework of agreement on the Bank Somoro uh, through CAB, the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Somoro. But unfortunately, uh, the president, uh, Pinoy Aquino, uh, had uh, left the office, but unfortunately, the BBL, the proposed Bank Somoro basic law, was not passed. Now we have the president, and uh, you know, uh, our good friend here, uh, Joseph, is very interested to our president, but he has three steps or pieces in solving the conflict in Mindanao. Number one is through uh, the formula of uh, uh, fighting strongly against terrorism. And he said that uh, he's going to use the full force of the military against the Busayaf. And uh, secondly, he wanted to increase the coordination with Malaysia and Indonesia and strengthen the government's uh, counter-terrorism uh, program. And uh, number three is to urge Congress to restore the death penalty and uh, strengthen the air and maritime patrol between Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. That's number one. Number two is about giving more uh, funds to Muslim Mindanao, which was also done by previous presidents. And uh, now, uh, about uh, last, last uh, Saturday, he was in my city, in Cotabato City, and he uh, spearheaded the program of, we call it Comprehensive Reform and Development Agenda, or CRDA, and initially uh, put about 59, 59 billion pesos, or equivalent to about 5 billion Malaysian ringgit, as initial programs for development or ending the poverty in Mindanao. Let us see what will happen on that 5 million ringgit in Mindanao. Number three, is about federalism. Uh, for Duterte, federalism is the answer. Now the question is, which, which, which is first thing to do? To pass the BBL in the Congress or come up with a new law or new, new government or shift to federalism? Uh, according to Duterte, uh, federalism is like a freedom. Hard to define, but if handled properly, is the way to go for organizing good governance for youth population with different ethnic groups. Or maybe you are interested also in coming up with his plan of action. Duterte, in one of his speeches, addressing concern about extremism, addressing concern about radicalization, addressing concern about terrorism, he said, in front of the military generals in Mindanao, and he said, if you want to solve the problem in Mindanao, act like a James Bond. Here, Allah James Bond. On how to do it, <laughs> I don't know. But he stated this many times that if you really wanted to solve the problem in the now, do it in the James Bond way. But anyway, what we are doing in the Philippine Center for Islamic Democracy are the following. One is, we know the, as mentioned by Sister Eliza, the important role of the FBO and the religious sector. You know, in the Philippines, there was a survey conducted by, by our program. Of all the leaders in Mindanao, the politicians, the governors, the mayors, the media, the businessmen, people had a very strong trust on our Muslim religious leaders. In the survey, that's about uh, more than 60% believe that the trusted group in, in Mindanao are the ulama in the stands. I hope I'm part of them, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, this is the real survey that we have conducted. Now, you know, in the Philippines, we have the Catholic Bishop Conference of the Philippines, the, the Christian side, and they really uh, make a very strong stance on many issues. But now our president is very uneasy, unfriendly, with the Catholic Bishop Conference of the Philippines. And uh, I don't know uh, what are the sentiments of our president, but he's very uh, unfriendly with the CBCP, the strongest organization 
of the Catholic Bishop Conference in the Philippines. Now, in our effort to solve radicalization and extremism, we have created the uh, National Ulama Conference of the Philippines. And in this conference, we have invited ulama from Indonesia and from Malaysia and Singapore and Brunei as well to witness uh, the network that we have organized, the Ulama Conference, and as, as a medium of uh, giving the right interpretation of what Islam is, the right interpretation of moderation, the right interpretation of Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if somebody would have different interpretation, then the, the problems arises. But Alhamdulillah, with the organized Ulama Conference of the Philippines, at least we have come up with one nationwide organization addressing the issue of terrorism, radicalization, and uh, uh, empowering the ulama in the region. We have also the program of AMAL, uh, uh, Action for Madrasa-Based Advocacies and Learnings. The word AMAL uh, can be written in Arabic in two ways. If you use the word AMAL in, in, in Alif or Hamza, AMAL means hope. If you're going to use the Ain in AMAL, means deed or work. So either of the two, either we, we, we use the AMAL bil Ain, or we use Amal bil Alif or Hamza, these are all for hope and work for the betterment of our people in Mindanao. Now, what are we doing in action or Amal? If you see the, 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 the slide, we have the peace sector, the human rights sector, the values formation, the good governance and electoral reform, the economic empowerment, the health sector, literacy education and environment. And the Philippine Center for Islamic Democracy is very active in all those sectors that we are working with. For example, aside from example, in electoral reform, the, the ulama had come up with an agreement with the Commission on Election that we do the advocacy on good election in the Philippines, more particularly in Mindanao. As because in the previous years, in the previous election, Mindanao was tagged as the cheating capital of the Philippines. Again, if you wanted to win election in Mindanao or in the Philippines, then you go to IRM and you will win, surely you will win. And uh, now we have done this, and Alhamdulillah, the, the, by the blessing of the Almighty, we are able to at least come up with a very strong position that election fraud is not part of Islam, that election fraud is not part of our growing, growing democracy. Now, we have also the common word, and our president, Ms. Amin Rasul, uh, uh, who is supposed to be uh, attending uh, us uh, today, uh, had met the, the Pope, and uh, we have a very strong uh, advocacy using the word, the, the a common word. A common word is already translated in many languages. Uh, in fact, we have already the, the Malay common word, Arabic common word, of course, the English, and even in Tagalog in the Philippines, we have already translated the common word. Uh, in various uh, local dialects. And we know the fact that this is very, very effective. Why? Because Islam and Christianity believe in strong God and believe in loving our neighbors. Love thy Lord and love thy neighbors. So these are the advocacies that we do using the common word or Christian friends in Mindanao. Now, according to Pope Francis, on common word, he said, Faced with uh, disconcerting episodes of violent fundamentalism, our respect for our true followers of Islam should lead us to avoid hateful generalization. For authentic Islam, in the proper reading of the Quran, are opposed to every form of violence. And this is the joy of gospel, and it was, it was said by Pope Francis on November 2013. Now, another advocacy that we're doing uh, with the Philippine Center of Islamic Democracy is our Maryam movement. What is Maryam movement? Maryam is, we join the word Mary in Christian and Maryam in Islam. So we combine Maryam into Maryam movement. And this Maryam movement is basically a, 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 a movement for our sisters, both Christian and Muslim, in advocating that indeed we Muslims and Christians love Mary, Maryam very closely, and we have no differences as far as our faith to, to Mary or Miriam's concern. Now, this advocacy for peace or interfaith dialogue 
is spreaded all over the country. More particularly, we organize symposia in colleges and universities, specifically targeting the youth about the concept of Mary Yam or Maryam. And this is very, very successful in many non-Muslim universities or colleges in Luzon, as well as Visayas, and as well as in Mindanao. We have also developed the peace building, uh, Islamic module for peace education. Uh, we are part of uh, crafting this one, and uh, we have already distributed this in the Philippines. And this module uh, on peace building is, is already becoming to be a part of the curriculum of the Philippine uh, uh, universities and colleges, both public and private school. So it is very effective because we told them that Islam, as mentioned by Eliza, is a peaceful religion. As Islam is religion for as a mercy to everybody. It's the reason why advocating for the Islamic model for peace education. We have also the empowering our women and ustajas or al ustajas. Now you know uh, sometimes this is very uh, new for the the, the 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 ears of everybody that in the Philippines, Alhamdulillah. Uh, although the Muslims are in minority, but we are able to empower our our sisters in Islam, and Alhamdulillah, they are very very effective. In fact. I'm sorry to say that sometimes our sisters in Islam are more active than our brothers in Islam. <laughs> and we have also the peace, uh, Women's Peace Collective. Now, this is the composition of different faiths, Christian and Muslim. And this Muslim uh, Women's Peace Collective uh, aims to uh, consolidate women's voices in achieving a just and lasting peace in Mindanao. And because everybody's tired of war, everybody's looking for peace in Mindanao, now we join hands with our sisters in faith, sisters from different religions to come up with one. We call that Women's Peace Collective in order to address extremism and uh, radicalization in Muslim Mindanao. And we have also developed a very new uh, one. We call it the Alimat Module. The Alimat Module is basically uh, related to the activities of our women, our sisters in Islam. And this is something to do with human rights. Uh, and we work very closely with our Human Rights uh, Commission in the Philippines. Uh, I am sure uh, your, uh, uh, our human rights in, in Malaysia is not like the human rights in the Philippines because our president does not love the Human Rights Commission in the Philippines for other reasons. So, anyway, and uh, we have developed this, this module and Alhamdulillah, it is now used in many, uh, we, have, we have trained uh, already people from different uh, provinces, and now, now they are very active in advocating the rights of everyone, both men and women, in the context of Islam. And finally, uh, today, uh, peace is within our reach. If we all together work together, inshallah, peace will be achieved. And uh, lastly, uh, we are, uh, I am appealing to everybody uh, so no to join us in praying that, inshallah, we'll be able to have peace in Mindanao with our new president, uh, Duterte. And uh, uh, we are already tired of war. Uh, we are already tired of running. We are, we are tired of hearing the helicopters, watchers, and what really we need is a total peace in Mindanao for the development of our children and for our future children and uh, for our future grand-grandchildren. Again, terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive presentation because you also went through the various root causes, um, including poverty, um, uh, root causes of discrimination and injustice, uh, issues pertaining to governance and corruption, and the unresolved issue of Mindanao. But I think outstanding is also the highlights of the innovation in terms of using the role of religious leaders, the common word, peace building, uh, using women uh, as a uh, main force of catalyst uh, in the process. And I think uh, these are things that we can learn in our collective experience uh, to then see um, uh, how we move on. I, I know time has passed on. Um, it's very difficult for a moderator to sort of control time, especially uh, to hear case studies, and especially for people who have 
flown quite a distance to come and share with us. Uh, I have also been on panels and sometimes people say, you know, you have to finish everything within five minutes. Uh, so I've just left it. We might have to cut some time at lunch to recover uh, time, uh, injury time. Uh, but I think uh, the next speaker, the name is quite significant, uh, Nikki Diamond. So I thought, uh, you know, there must be, if I did a Google search, which I did early this morning to find out who this guy is, how does he look like. Uh, and then I came across this article, and I think you should try and read the article, why I became a human rights activist. It's a very interesting story of, a personal story that he shares of his hiking to Nagaland. Uh, and then he comes across uh, this real issue of death of a lady uh, who was, you know, they were trying to deliver the baby uh, in a traditional method, uh, and the whole issue of the human right and access uh, to health, uh, and how that transformed his life in that hiking trip. And also subsequently a story of a snake bite and a colleague dying because of lack of access uh, to health care. Uh, and that leads on uh, to his work in Youth for Social Change, uh, and now with uh, 45 rights. He holds an Emmy in Human Rights, um, and I think he comes as a young man, or rather looking young <laughs> among us. Uh, but to share the experiences of uh, people in Myanmar who are really struggling with rights uh, in the context of military rule, uh, and in this move in Myanmar towards democracy, and I think this will be an interesting story uh, for the communities uh, faced with extremism uh, or in the onslaught uh, of uh, the dominance of the state uh, and the reform that is taking place at the democratic. Let's give him a hand uh, at this point. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, and i um, so glad to be here. Um, so today, um, my name is Nikki Diamond, and I'm from Burma, Myanmar. And today, my topics I'm going to talk about the uh, how uh, military regime, you know, uh, manufacture anti-Muslim settlement and judicial harassment toward religious um, marginalized community in Myanmar. So this is my topic, and I'm currently working for for the far rights as a human rights uh, uh, specialist. So my presentation will divide it into two parts. One part I like to introduce the history of uh, anti-Muslim settlement in Myanmar. So I like to begin uh, uh, 1930 to up to the contemporary Myanmar. And second part is, you know, I have been doing research on judicial harassment, so particularly on the minor um, marginalized community in Myanmar. So this is the... Uh, so some of you may not be familiar with the uh, radical movement or uh, nationalist movement in Myanmar. Maybe uh, if you follow some news, you, know, you may know the violent outbreak in uh, Rakhine State, October 2012, and also this is a huge outbreak. And um, another one is in Meitila in 2013. So the kind of uh, anti-Muslim violent outbreak. So I try to look at that issue, you know, why we have uh, anti-Muslim settlement. So I trace back to 1930, and time Muslim settlement under the, under the colonial movement, so quite significant, uh, impacting current deal and time Muslim movement in Myanmar. So I have seen a one source like in early 1930, so a well-known Larius is talking about you know the Indian Muslims so because of the under British colony, we have a, a huge wave of anti, uh, a huge wave of Indian immigration uh, migration. So um, at the time, 
entire colonial movement is generated, was generated in anti-Indian Muslim settlement. So this is the source, you know, one of the guy wrote about the popular sound and lyrics in that time, so early 1930. And second, uh, the later in 1950, so another one is, you know, that one, that book is also very famous in Burma right now. The so contemporary uh, anti-Muslim settlement is also generated in that book. That book name is you know, Miu Piao Ma So Chao Lari. In translation, fear of losing one race. So it is a kind of idea of uh, racial purification. So when people try, uh, want to maintain their blood line or blood purification, so all of the anti-Muslim, uh, the current deal anti-Muslim settlement are generated in that boat. So this is what I see is this is the source of anti-Muslim uh, so boat in Myanmar. So particularly the idea or the idea discussed in that boat is you know basically fear of losing one race, fear of losing you know Burmese race or something like that. So based on racial purification and religious purification. At the time, that book focused on uh, Bengali. So at the time, we don't, uh, we, we don't have uh, anti-Muslim uh, movement. At the time, we have anti-Bengali movement or anti-Indian uh, Muslim movement. So, Contemporary anti-Muslim movement, you know, sometimes we can look at the house take, you know, using uh, motto like, you know, th this is the photo taken in the uh, Ministry of uh, Population and Immigration. So saying like, human cannot disappear one swallow by an art. Human can disappear one swallow by human. So it's me, you know, it's the, this motto is uh, gen generated in the idea of uh, losing, you know, uh, purification, racial purification, religious purification. So that was, that model was used in the, uh, has been used in the Ministry of Population Home Affairs since 1982, right after and adding 1982 citizenship law. So you, some of you may be quite familiar with the 1982 citizenship law, so which deeper or which uh, exclude you know, Rohingya Muslim in Burma. So most of Muslim became stateless. This is the, uh, another scholar. Uh, she documented the uh, kinds of pamphlet, uh, leaflet, anti-Muslim uh, salmon you know, during 1996 and 1997. So she documented and write in her book. So most of the idea is, and one, one idea is the economic threat or threat to motherland. So talking about uh, land. So all the land in the country shall be owned by Muslim. So this is a kind of creating uh, economic threat toward Buddhist society or community. So another one is many, um, so Muslim doing a business and having a profit and they will uh, marry a uh, uh, Buddhist woman or something like that, and yeah, talk about the business threat, and also like a societal uh, threat, like you know, okay, Buddhist uh, woman, uh, Muslim man trying to get married Buddhist woman. Sometimes uh, that kind of anti-Muslim movement portray Islam or Muslim always associated with the global terrorism or Islamic terrorism. So that's a kind of idea of generating fear toward Buddhists. Uh, this pamphlet, anti-Muslim pamphlet was uh, circulated in, uh, during the violent outbreak in Rakhine, October 2012. So sometimes, you know, the, the violence is, you know, uh, uh, that kind of anti-Muslim violence, uh, sorry, that kind of anti-Muslim pamphlet is signal to elevate the violence. So these kinds of pamphlets, some kinds of uh, religious sermon have been 
distributed or circulated right before the outbreak of the violin. So this is the evidence of uh, before. So, um, you may know about the will to, you know, will to deliver his speed in Rakhine, you know, right before the uh, Rakhine violin. And so, which is, his speed is like a signal to elevate the violin. So this is the source of how military is uh, manufacturing anti-Muslim sentiment. So that's why I call institu institutionalized anti-Muslim sentiment. So I have that uh, bold uh, document in Burmese version, and also Al Jazeera also have that document and translate it in and make an article talking about promotion of Muslim threat in Burma or Myanmar. Uh, that document says, uh, whenever military officer or civilian officer in the government have promotion, they have to attend the training. So that training talk those officers with anti-Muslim sentiment. So they are brainwashing people. They are brainwashing the, um, uh, government employee or civil servant to have anti-Muslim sentiment. So this is the sole I, I have that how military regime and how military institution brainwashing people to have anti-Muslim sentiment. Basically, their idea is, you know, fear of extinction or race, you know, particularly talking about racial purification. Another thing is I like to talk about the means of dissemination, how anti-Muslim sentiment have been, you know, separate. So they use, they publish uh, Mapata, the organization of protecting race and religion, that organization have at least three types of journal publishing anti-Muslim sentiment, sometimes history in their journal. So people who read, you know, their journal over and over again and again, you know, very likely to adapt their ideology, the anti-Muslim sentiment and um, Buddhist nationalist ideology. Yeah, this is the very uh, famous quote by uh, Wurya Du. So he said, like, you can be full of kindness and love, but you cannot sleep next to a mad dog. If, if we are weak, our land will become Muslim. So he is a very uh, significant, and he is a, a kind of uh, religious leader, Buddhist religious leader. So normal, ordinary people, you know, who don't have a lot of uh, critical thinking and understanding, very likely to follow his saying, because uh, he is uh, a kind of uh, religious authority or moral authority. So he have that power and position. So. I quote or I use the one uh, idea. A kinds of the kinds of uh, settlement so happen you know, psychological process in individual and social process in groups. You know, so what I mean is radicalization and radical movement. So individually and society, I mean uh, the groups you know within the community happen. So these are the uh, corroborative empirical evidence I call the manufacturing institutionalized anti-Muslim settlement. So recently, uh, Lieutenant General Joshua, who is the Minister of Population and uh, Immigration, oh, sorry, no, uh, he is the Minister of Home Affairs. So he said like, uh, for us, one man only marry a woman, but for them, a man marry four women and having a lot of children, and uh, Burma will be taken over by Muslim. So that kind of argument. Why, the reason why he said like, like this, because of when he was young, I mean, when he was a, a normal military officer, he had to attend, you know, training with anti-Muslim anti settlement, you know, how he, he was uh, brainwashed. So that's the evidence that, you know, he sincerely believed in it, and he said it to the media, publicly. 
So he had that kind of ideology, that kind of misinformed, you know, uh, anti-Muslim sentiment. I mean, military institution, you know, brainwashed their products like this. So another one is the senior general may outline. Uh, this year, he said, like, you know, um, the purpose of military is not only protecting national security, but also protecting race and religion. So it's me, you know, they are manufacturing religious nationalism. So what I say is they are man manufacturing religious nationalism to, to combat NLD, democratization and democratic movement in Burma. Another one is recently the chairman of USDP, uh, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, said like, you know, under the, under the name of protecting national security, uh, race and religion, and also if we have a de uh, national disaster. So these three main things uh, can justify whatever they need to do or whatever they want to do. So one interesting point is here, under the name of protecting race and religion, everything can be justified including violence or including, you know, anything or violating all the laws, you know, domestic laws or something like that. So this is the ideology of, you know, military back party and also how military and so USDP is a previously um, ruling party last 2010 and 2015. So they have the kind of sentiment and they are mobilizing people. So what I want to say is, you know, sometimes these, these kinds of ideology you know, was a signal to activate the violence toward Muslim community in Myanmar. These are the same evidence of, you know, same area in Myanmar, uh, village, township, was became no Muslim allowed. So uh, that kind of radical movement happen in some rural areas, some villages. So we, I received more than a dozen of the kind of poster um, hanging around the same Buddhist um, villages. So opposing of having a very strong anti-Muslim settlement and Buddhist nationalist movement is you know, gaining a weight. These are some examples. So no Muslim allow. Don't do business with Muslim. So no Muslim, no Muslims are not allowed to marry with the Buddhist woman or something like this. Very strong uh, poster. So if someone, I mean, from Buddhist community, having a deal or doing business, so they became a kind of betrayal to um, the Buddhist community. So that kind of, uh, I, I would. Normally, I would say like a demonization of Muslim. So by using the kinds of poster and uh, saying, uh, using the kinds of poster, you know, kinds of ways of demonizing Muslim. So to get my long story short, so uh, another part of my presentation is talk about uh, judicial harassment, but I will make it short. Uh, the state manufacture institutional like anti-Muslim settlement, and on the other hand, they portray, you know, Burma have a terrorist movement and terrorist operation. And then state arrest a lot of Muslim. So I have been monitoring and working on three cases. Like a one case is they called Myanmar Muslim Army, and 12, Mus 12 Muslim defendant arrested. And um, Tangji case, 20 Muslim. Tangji case is very interesting, like, you know, uh, a family went to Tangji for sand wedding. On the will, they got arrested, a accusation of they connected to uh, Islamic terrorism or something like that. And another one named Abdurrahman. So when the defendant is 14 years old, and actually during uh, that family, um, study at the Islamic Madrasa in, near, in Mandalay. So during the Ramadan, uh, the school closed and they went back 
And after Ramadan end, they came back to Mandalay and to continue their study. But on the way, they got arrested by the accusation of they connected to Islamic terrorism or something like that. And then all these three cases, but we have uh, other cases, but I'm working on the kind of cases right now. So the similar pattern is military, Burma military is portraying we have terrorist operation in Burma in order to have uh, support from West and US to buy military weapon and uh, to get the funding or support from EUs in the West. That's why they are portraying, they are manufacturing anti-Muslim settlement and also portraying uh, that kind of terrorist uh, people arresting by showing. Also, yeah. So I only have three minutes to get my presentation short. So I like to, uh, from my presentation, I like to introduce a one possible advocacy framework. So I call, uh, how to combat extremism. I see three main actors. One is the government, so government as a whole, you know. And second one is the inter international community. Third one is civil society movement. So these three actors need to be cooperated to, to build a political me mechanism to have a platform work together. So government who have a power, international community who have a lot of resources, civil society working on the ground and connecting with the people. So these three actors need to be worked together, need to be cooperated in order to combat you know, extremism and radical movement. So we need that kind of co uh, cooperation and that kind of political platform. So I'd like to conclude my presentation uh, military in Burma, military institution and religious institution, manufacture institution like uh, Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim settlement, and also under the name of combating so-called terrorism in Burma, they used to arrest a lot of people. So that's a terrible human rights violation. Uh, so legal abuses, access to justice, fell transgender, civil liberty, this issue you know, currently in Burma well, Muslim or Rohingya, you know, these people are facing right now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, for uh, also a very comprehensive presentation, but I think Nikki highlighted the institutionalization, uh, the indoctrination, the brainwashing, and the alternative dialogue that needs to take place to undo uh, what has been done institutionally uh, is a major task uh, in that model. But his uh, advocacy framework um, as a suggestion and access to justice and fundamental liberties uh, are ways pointing to the future possibilities, especially for Myanmar uh, in the road to democracy now. Okay. Hi, name? Um, my name is Amanda Chiang, and I'm a PhD student in sociology and social policy from Princeton University. Um, and uh, my comment is that I really appreciate how uh, Ms. Alisa Walheed drew attention to an increasingly important and relevant platform to uh, the issues that we're talking about today. Um, which is this dimension of social media. And your talk encouraged me to reflect upon how social media provides both opportunities but also challenges to fostering a more tolerant society. So it provides opportunities in that social media um, brings about this democratization of idea creation and consumption, but it also creates challenges because not only does social media provide a space for extremism and hate speech to spread on this new scale, as you mentioned, but also because of the way that um, people are consuming um, media today, it's becoming um, polarized, right? So liberals, for example, are consuming liberal-leaning media and communicating more exclusively with uh, like-minded liberals, which reinforces their views and um, insulates them from contrary ideas and opinions, and the same for people Christian, on please, other sides of the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
I'm wondering in the Malaysian context where freedom of speech and expression is becoming increasingly under threat, um, how do we strike this balance between um, protecting a free and democratic space for exchanging ideas, but at the same time uh, dealing with the spread of um, extremism and hate speech, particularly on social media platforms? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elisa? Thank you uh, for uh, your question. Amanda, right? Amanda, okay. Uh, so Amanda, I, I strongly believe in what you were saying about uh, how social media can pose uh, as, as a, uh, an opportunity for, uh, to engage more and more people towards democratization. In Indonesia, we use uh, social media heavily to influence and even to uh, set some pressures. Like for example, with the use of change.org, we uh, online petitions in Indonesia have been very successful in pushing for, for uh, several cases or issues. Uh, but at the same time, I, uh, I usually say to, uh, in my presentation uh, about social media, I, I usually said, uh, I mentioned about how social media and internet is capitalized most by the conservative groups. So they are, um, they have more readiness to embrace these opportunities. They have, if uh, uh, if you look at the memes that I've um, I've put on uh, early on, the memes are very uh, creative and. Uh, exciting to be with and and go straight to your uh, core values like uh, for example humanity or feeling of uh, sentiments or uh, belongingness to a group that's uh, that's the kind of things wording or uh, messages that has been spreading in in social media and because of that uh, this uh, this this um, the mainstream public are usually uh, they they are led to believe that that these are uh, the correct messages that uh, they uh, they might want to be a part of. So this uh, identity politics is heavily used on social media. Uh, that's uh, that's the challenge of uh, social media. But at the same time, if we uh, if we more or less uh, employ the same strategies, if we if we are willing to uh, put more effort to capitalize on social media, then we will have the same uh, the same result also. So this is what uh, we believe, and this is what we are uh, trying to uh, strengthen right now in Indonesia to set up a more systematic and a comprehensive way, not only you know being reactive to. Uh, some issues, like for example, in Indonesia, uh, uh, say a message about polygamy, and then um, we are reactive to that. Not, not that. That is uh, dancing on the, the drums that has. What's what's the English um, expression? Dancing on the tune of the of the drum that has been uh, that other peoples are playing. So we want to make sure that we are we are setting the tone. We are um, uh, what doing the we are setting the drum beats, not dancing on uh, to the, the the drum beats that is uh, organized or orchestrated by other people. So we have to come up with uh, different uh, different narratives. Yes, to counter the extreme narratives, but we have to uh, set up our own narrative. So in Indonesia, uh, what we're trying to do right now is like uh, pop you, uh, to revitalize what, uh, the, the spirit of hubul waton minal iman, that is uh, to love your country is part of your faith. 
this is very uh, powerful in Indonesia. That's what we're trying to, uh, the narratives that we are trying to uh, get across to as many people as possible. So what about in Malaysia? I think the, 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 the people who, uh, especially the, the people from, from civil society should uh, try to find your uh, most effective strategies in, in social media because because with the threat to freedom of speech, uh, with the politics, sometimes it's hard to do a, an offline strategy, but online you can, uh, you can improvise, you can strategize, you can be creative and uh, engage as many people as possible. It's just that it's really something new for civil society organization because it's, you know, uh, we're not used to, to social media or campaign. We don't really believe that change can be pushed through social media. But uh, in Indonesia, we do. So it's uh, really important. I would suggest uh, friends in Malaysia to strengthen their voice over the social media also. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, OK. Um, <clears throat> my question uh, is for any of the panel to take. Um, uh, this uh, is about between religions and politics. Um, do, do you agree with me that religions uh, actually are not created to cause problems, but actually to end the problems? But when religions get entangled with politics, they become like arrows that have veered off target. Um, so the problem is when these arrows of religious teachings that the leaders take from the cover of the scriptures should be able to awaken spirituality in the followers. But when this target is missed and religion become vehicles for protecting individual interests, problems begins to arise. So do you think that our problem right now in Malaysia specifically uh, and in the world generally, is because of the mixing of politics and religion. So should we do away, or not do away, what I, I don't mean to do away religion, but to keep religion in the private sphere, and to actually politics be politics, no interference of religion. Do you think that may help our situation in Malaysia? Thank okay, you. thank you, Siti. Who else, please? Okay, okay, there. Yes, does Karu uh, come close to the mic? Yes, yourself first with the mic. Yes, yes. Um, my name is Isaac Shamsuddin from Community Muslim Universal. My question is di directed to Mr. Nikki. As a human rights activist working in a human rights uh, atmosphere, um, what do you think about the process of democratization in Myanmar right now after the Suji's uh, party just won the election? How do you see that could resolve uh, a, con a religious conflict between um, uh, Buddhism and Mus uh, Buddhists and Muslims, and how that could move on from the coup, um, you know, sentiment of uh, harshness, so on and so forth? Because I see, um, for example, from the BBC interview with Suji's how she's very reluctant to denounce the ethnic cleansing that's happening in Myanmar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yourself, Jen. My name yeah. is Pravin. I'm from Sayana Bangsa, Malaysia in Australia. My question is to Superintendent Ahmad Asmadi. Superintendent, thank you for your views. Uh, such discussion with uniformed personnel is always reassuring, so thank you. Some might say your views are comforting in contrast to the UMNO president, Dr. Sri Najib Raza, who was reported to have praised the bravery of ISIL fighters in 2014. In your view, how is it that extreme ideologies uh, seep into multi-ethnic, multi-religious Malaysia, such that as many as 26 extremist groups have been identified domestically? Even if there is external influence, why is the mindset locally able to accept these extreme ideologies. What is causing this and what are we doing to address it? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's going to take a whole day to answer, but uh, we will try. 
Yes, final. My name is Karupia from Prasatwan Pumbangan Social. Uh, I have only one question. Uh, firstly, uh, I am very impressed with uh, the superintendent's uh, view, uh, mainly about national interests in uh, combating the terrorism and also extremism. My question here is about regional interests. I strongly feel that we should have a regional interest, mainly on ASEAN interests of combating the uh, terrorism, extremism and racial issues. So my question here, what is the potential for forming the common regional interest on extremism, racism and our new uh, enemy called terrorism? What is the panel member's recommendation or strategies to reach the regional interests in a shorter time period? Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Kevin, thank you. Uh, shall we start with superintendent? Maybe you have one or two minutes, two questions, one minute each. Thank you for the question. It's quite tough for me to answer. But I got two counterparts here that maybe can help me if I'm not answering it properly. The first one is about the extreme ideology, isn't it? So, there's so many factors if you want to discuss it here. But the grievances that happen to many of the extreme group, because it's, it's actually going for a term of process in what group and in which society that they belong. So, it's become a one process, maybe affecting of uh, Islam versus Christian, for example, East versus West, political of hatred, uh, you talk about jihad. For example, I quote uh, one quotation that been given by one of the prominent JI leaders, uh, Abu Bakar Bashir. Uh, maybe I have to look what is he said here. In his mind, he said, uh, sorry, I can find it. <laughs> That's what Abu Bakr Bashir said before. Uh, he's a uh, preacher to so many groups. And what he said, I'm only a craftsman selling knives. I'm not responsible for how those knives are used. So it's a very simple word when you talk about jihad, for example. Certain group, how they accept it, how they take it, if they don't have any understanding about the real Islam or about real jihad. So what they find out about it, so they will take action according to what they know. And certain people, when they heard about that type of words, they just receive it and keep it in their mind. They just been radical in their own mind only. But in certain parties, they take it as a very serious thing. That's why they think they need to do something. If they cannot make, manage to handle the, it properly, it will take a rough action as uh, involving with also with uh, involving with the suicide bombers. Or, uh, for their own action because they want to achieve it. So this is the part of the thing that we, we need to understand. And the root cause of the incident is so many, is many things. Sometimes it's about their own belief. Sometimes because they want to uh, clear himself or they want to become a real Muslim or whatsoever. But in their own understanding, not in a proper uh, situation. So this thing, if we not control it properly, not explain it properly, and we not control and handle it properly, it will be a, a, like a time bomb for us if we not uh, settle it. So I think this is a part of the answer that I can give to you because it's a part and long question, a long uh, explanation about this one. Because they, they got their own root cause. So they also have, uh, because of the certain group, they have their own mind. How they want to recruit certain, certain people to become and involved with their organization. So what is their main objective? Because not everybody is uh, having a good mind or having a good objective, but they just want to achieve for their own group activities. So that, that's the thing that I can answer for your question just now. And the other one is, I'm not so clear about the question. Should there be a regional operation to address it? 
Yes, it should be. And actually, we are also having a close relationship with all agencies, not just in the ASEAN, but throughout uh, with other uh, sites, especially with the West, all intelligent agencies, because we cannot work alone. We cannot work alone. Because the issues happen in Syria, for example. It also will affect certain people in Malaysia or, uh, or in uh, other, other states. So the cooperation is very needed. So with that cooperation, we can combat more effectively. Because now the transnational crimes, they are crossing border. They are not just uh, living, for example, like we say, they are staying in Malaysia, but their activities, they can contribute all issues to other countries through the social media or whatever communication that they have. Thank you. Thank you. Mickey, on yeah. uh, democratization in Myanmar. Yes. Aung San Suu Kyi. Yeah. Um, yeah, to answer the question, Shop, we have a very uh, strong hope, you know, that uh, we, in the past, under the military regime or Deng Seng regime, we never have a chance to raise or consent those issues. Right now, NLD is the alleged official government, so somehow we can talk to them. Uh, there's maybe you know some kinds of limitation, but we still have limitation. But uh, and also, I like to elaborate, you know. Uh, Anti-Muslim violence is the product of military regime, product of military. So right now, the military trying to create that kind of chaos, that kind of violence to show their permanent power in order to maintain their power. That's why they are creating that kind of institutional anti-Muslim violence uh, in Burma. So the problem is you know, how uh, military civil relation, you know, the NLD can build during this five year and I mean in the future. So that's, I think that's my short answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Politics and religion. Yes. Uh, you, know, you know, in the Philippines, there is the so called separation of church and state, meaning uh, politics is politics, then government is government. But uh, for me, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, Islam, as a Muslim, I strongly believe that Islam is not only a religion where you uh, practice the five pillars of Islam. But Islam is the way of life. When I speak of the way of life, meaning it encompasses every aspect of human lives, politics, economics, social, everything is in Islam. Uh, if you remember when, 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 when the last and final uh, verse of the Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in, in Arafah during his uh, last Hajj, Allah said that today I had perfected the religion and uh, completed my favor unto you and chosen Islam as your religion. Meaning, when Allah perfected Islam, it, it, it involves everything. It is not only going to the mosque, it's not only about giving the zakat, it's not about only going for hajj, but the way of life. It involves everything. Allah alam. Thank you very much. Well, folks, uh, city, I hope you don't get indigestion as a result. <laughs> Maybe tougher. Uh, but, uh, folks, let's give a hand to the panel. We have had a fascinating discussion. We have looked at the critical root causes and issues. It's not a simple thing. We look at countries that are having innovative action, especially Indonesia and also the Philippines. The struggles in Malaysia and especially Myanmar uh, are real uh, in all these regions, but there are good examples that are moving beyond. And I think with that note, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the patience. I'm sure some of you are really hungry. Uh, I'll pass on the time to Ryan.